Hello everyone, and welcome back. Well, when I finished filming last time, the following day I lost a day because of the rain. And then yesterday they came out um, without telling me they were gonna show up and set the outdoor wood boiler and ran all the lines. And so then this morning I had to go get furnaces for this building and the back side of the workshop which are right here because five days from now they're going to come and set everything up so I wanted to at least get these here so they can hook up to whatever they need to on here or make sure I have the right parts to do it or whatever. And now this afternoon I just finished doing the joist hangers, the last of the hurricane clips and now I've got the line snapped for doing the floor plywood. Melissa should call me in just a few minutes on her ride home from work and then after that I'll come out here and at least get started on this. Well, Melissa, she's back from work now, and I want to at least get this first row laid. I snapped that line, the sheet, from the outside of the tongue on this side to this side here was a little bit under 48. It was like 47 and 3 quarters, so I snapped my line at 48. And now I tack in both sides, and then you can go down here, and most of the time these sheets are kind of pre-marked. I mean, it's a wide mark, but it's close enough for what you're looking for. So we'll center it. Like this one here, you can see it has to go to the right. And that'll be your guide. You'll tack, you'll nail every one of these. Then I'll come back with the gun. And you want to shoot it with a two and three eighths inch ring shank nail, which is what I'll be doing. And once again, these have to be okay for ACQ or treated lumber. And yeah, we'll just go right down the line. I don't have any joists on this side that have been moved off layout for plumbing or anything. So should just be straightforward, slamming them right down the line. I did lay a bead of subfloor adhesive on every one of the joists. You want to always do that. Uh, really saves you from squeaks and just holds everything together real nice. You have to do it by code, but you know, it's just, it's a good thing. If you notice that your nail gun is not sinking the heads in below the surface or you know at least flush with the surface like this one here the last nail before I need to switch it out it'll kick that nail up letting me know that I, I have to switch them. Um, you want to make sure you beat those down right now or turn up your air compressor so you're getting more uh, pressure pushing it in because later on when you come through here and you've done all your taping 
and you've got chunks of taping mud all over and you're scraping the floor, running into those nails drive you about nuts. And then you still got to go back and beat them in with a hammer. So you might as well beat them in right now and uh, take care of that problem so you don't have to deal with it later on. And now let's see, a question that might come up is why am I using an OSB plywood versus a CDX? OSB being oriented strand board versus the CDX, which I don't really know what it stands for, regular plywood. Uh, a couple of reasons. One, this is uh, half price or a little less than half price. Second of all, I'm not putting any real wood floor in here. If I was putting in a real wood floor, I would have to have like the regular plywood to be able to nail to it. Not so critical when it comes to doing tile because you're going to be putting a backer board down anyway. But I'm not planning on putting any tile in here either. It'll be vinyl, probably in the bathrooms, and then some kind of a plank, you know, uh, fake wood floor in the rest of the house. So that's the reason. Another reason is it'll be, you know, two weeks before I, or up to two weeks before I have the trusses and the, the plywood on and get it um, blacked in so that it's waterproof and so it's going to get rained on a few times, which is not a big deal at all on either plywood. But I found that you do have more trouble if you don't get the real expensive uh, CDX with it delaminating faster than this stuff will start swelling. So the, the main reason was since I'm not putting any wood floor in, I may, there's no reason to spend that extra money. But there are several reasons why you either do want to or not want to use uh, the CDX over the OSB. Well, as much as I want, I just continue laying plywood right now. Uh, I'm going to get on the mower. The front yard hasn't been mowed in two weeks. Uh, last time I was mowing, I broke the belt on the, the newer mower, so I have to use the old one. I haven't even had time to go in and get a new belt for that, but now the next row when we start like these, this was just, you know, 8, 16, 24, 32. The next one now, we could just cut 16 inches off, but I will cut 32 inches off because this 32 inch piece will work on the end. And it's just better if you can stay in. It's not critical at all. Lots of times you just use what you have. Uh, but if you can stay in 32 inches, sometimes this might be up higher or something on the ends. Uh, we did really good this time. Everything is real flush. And it's better to span over and have a, you know, a double on the end. It's also stronger. So we'll do a 32. I'm not saying that we won't end up doing a 16 somewhere along the line, but it's just more comfortable to do that. Or you can even do four foot if you want. But on this floor, being 32 feet, there's really no reason. Whatever 16 you do, you can just fill in on the end when you get to the end of the row. One thing that I really like about this building being 22 feet wide versus 24, if it was 24, this would be you know right about 12 feet. So your plywood would be 4, 8, 12 feet. There's a lot of crap going on right here. We've got the header, two joists, two joist hangers, Everything is coming together right here, and if my plywood ends there, we also have a seam. By being 22 feet, my seam is going to be over here, which just is another layer of something to really tie that in tight together. It doesn't always work that way because, you know, most of the time you'd think you'd want to do 24, but for with the sewer being there, the building being here, 22 was a, a better way to go. And it's really not that wasteful at all because anything that I, like when I did my plywood, like for the walls, you know, 24 feet comes out even, but 22 feet, there'll be a two-foot scrap. Well, that can go on the back wall because they'll need a two-footer there. And when we go down here and we do this plywood, you know, you want the tongue and groove, but you'll be cutting half that sheet off. And that half a sheet can be used for the next one. I'll show you. We just have to block all the seams to make it legal and nice and tight. But that's it for tonight. They said it's going to be... Zero mile visibility because of fog tomorrow morning. When Melissa left work, 
you know, she works in Superior, so it's right on Lake Superior. She came across the bridge into Duluth, and it was so foggy that when she was on the bridge, she couldn't see the other side of the bridge. So the warm air from south is already starting to hit the cold air coming off the lake, and it's creating fog, and that's supposed to transfer up here in the morning. So I really want to do some mowing tonight because we've had two wet days in a row and tomorrow everything's going to be wet if it's foggy. Good morning everybody. Just out here trying to get some more of this plywood laid. One thing I should have mentioned yesterday when you're doing this plywood, make sure you measure the sheet because they are notorious for getting these lines off. This one, a lot of these are off an inch, inch and a quarter. You know, I want 16, 32, 48, but if you relied on these marks, sometimes you'll get plywood where it's awesome. This is not one of those times. Whenever you have a situation like this, make sure you glue that center beam also. Last chance of squeaks. Well, this is the thing I talked about earlier, how I have enough pieces of plywood to cover this, but exactly enough pieces of plywood. I do not have any an extra sheet so I can do, you know, groove into the tongue on this half. So I had to split this one down the middle, and then I'm going to want factory to factory, so this is the groove side. I'm going to put the groove side against here because now it doesn't have a tongue. We cut that off. So to do that, there can't be any sway in the plywood this way. So then we have to come in here and block it. It doesn't have to be the whole entire way across. It just has to be a block in there. We nail it solid here, we nail it solid here. Nothing can move. So I, I only have to do it for the one piece. I actually thought I might have enough. <laughs> but when I did, I would have had exactly the right amount of plywood. But we added that cantilever on there. So. I, I don't have that, those other half of sheets. So this is what we have to do. Oh, 
want to make sure that sucks up tight because if it doesn't you're going to have to put a screw in there to make sure it's tight otherwise you're going to get some squeaks the deck is on now I didn't nail these two right here because I still don't know if I'm gonna shorten up that cantilever or not I was gonna shorten it up to here I think it was the other day and then Melissa was like why and I didn't have time to debate it at the time I need to figure out exactly where the cabinets are gonna end and you know you can get like a six inch filler that can go on the end or I can figure it out, you know, pretty much exact. It's almost nice to have a little bit of filler though, because if you figure out your wall is perfect and then your sheetrock, a lot of times you're going to go in there and once you get taping mud and everything, everything gets a little bit smaller and you're trying to cram that in there. So we'll see. So I just left this corner. Uh, and once I start laying walls out, we'll be able to figure that out. Well, Melissa was just out here for about a half hour. I had some critical stuff, like how big to build the bedroom versus living room, how deep, um, fitting a dresser in here, closet, and it actually went pretty good. Uh, we did get it figured out, and everybody left fairly happy. <laughs> actually, I told her, I said, that went pretty good. I said, I didn't think that you would last as that long out here before your head exploded. And she said, you're such an ass. And I said, oh, I didn't mean it like that. I just meant that I didn't think that you thought we would get to a certain point and then have to come back to it another time. But apparently, once again, I didn't use the correct words. But anyway, it was uh, productive and I kind of know what's going on. We didn't get the bathroom laid out yet, but we, made, we got the main part done here. What I'm doing now is I have these critical decisions that were made here. I have the line snapped, but if it rains out, my chalk lines are gonna be gone, and then we're gonna have to go through that whole entire discussion again, and I'm not gonna remember the measurement. So it's always smart to mark your lines even if you just do the ends if you don't have a lot of time so you can re-snap because then if it rains the lines will still be there X means what side the wall is going to sit on
So if we look at it like this, this is going to be the bedroom right here. The bed will go against this wall. We're going to do like a 20 inch window here, a 20 inch window there, queen bed in the center. I have the queen bed up in the front garage. And, uh, and then over here, we're going to do a full four foot by four foot window so you have egress to get out. And then this corner here is actually where the bedroom ends. And uh, there'll be a two six door right here, which will open in. Uh, in the matching set with that bed, there's one nightstand, which there'll be about two feet between the bed and the wall on each side. And then I can get a 20 inch window in there. The, uh, the nightstand is about 20, it'll, it'll fit right between there perfectly. And then what we're going to do is there's a 64 inch dresser which can go against this wall which will come up to about here because the bed the bed ends right here and so if a dresser they don't come out more than 20 inches that leaves you at least four feet between there that'll come out 64 inches and then that leaves me right here four foot eight Yeah, about four foot eight. So here I can put a four foot bifold closet. So a closet, when you build, when you lay them out, you'll have your two by four wall. Then from inside of the wall to in to against the a back wall is 25 and a half inches. That gives you, a, you know, 24 and a half in between the walls. Perfect for hanging your clothes. You can go a little bit smaller. 25 and a half is, is the standard number. So we'll have that. And then I can have a closet here, and then since this over here is going to be bathroom, on the back side of the bathroom, which will be here, this is room where a person could put a linen closet. Because more than likely, unless we change something, which we very well, uh, very well could do, this wall could come all the way through at that 25 and a half, leaving you closet space for the bedroom here, linen closet here. But I can tell you right now, more than likely, that's not what's going to happen. I'm guessing that this will end up being wherever this closet is. I need five feet for a tub, which is right there. And then I would want a five and a half inch wall sticking out because the tub sticks out 30 inches. I'm going to want to come out 32 with a wall here. This will already be 25 and a half, so that little stub will barely stick out. And then tub could sit here, two by six plumbing wall here for the faucet. And then it have to be a vanity, a toilet, a window in the bathroom. They'll probably will be able to put a window in there. I think it's better to keep this tub uh, more away from the outside wall in this situation because it'll just let more light in if I can get a window over there. And now we're going to decide because this bathroom ends up being exactly about 10 feet deep. We can go as wide as we want up to a point because on that side this wall here is going to go will be straight through from front to back which is really going to be nice for a set of trusses. If this is where the bathroom was let's see it. Let's just pretend we had that we did do that and we had a tub sticking out 30 against this one and then a vanity which would be 21 let's just give that 24 54 and then I'm gonna want 30 inches of walk space yeah it ends up being about here started laying that out and then that's when Melissa said uh, that was enough for now. We need to figure out this layout. I can do here, or I can shorten it up by burying that tub back in that side like we talked about. But anyway, this room here, right here will be a door to go out. So that's your second exit in the house. And this room will have furnace, water heater, washer, dryer, and just some storage, you know, because there is no real closet for anything. I wonder if I can get a 
I don't know though, this is all going to be kitchen so there can be linen. Because then where this wall is, I think the door to this room will be right here. And the bathroom, it'll either be here or there depending on how we lay that out. Bedroom door was there. Probably be right here. And I want this to be a three foot door so it's easier to get the washer and dryer and stuff in and out. And if you leave that open, I want to have a, that door there and probably a window out that backside too. So this is a really bright room for when you're doing laundry and stuff. It's just nice to have it bright. So then if we look at it like that, this is the wall that's running down the whole almost center of the building. Center of the building is actually here. Then you're sitting in the kitchen right now. So this is all kitchen and then living room, just wide open. It gets to be a little bit of a narrow living room because the door, in this, this uh, blueprint, the door is not centered. It's offset and that's how, there was a drawing of one that was 22 by 32 and it was offset there too. So I'm definitely going to do the two small windows, one on each side of the bed. Over here I'm just going to do a four foot by four foot. Definitely be some glass going out this way probably two four footers and then there'll be one above the kitchen sink which is in the back and then like where you're standing to your right nothing there because that's where the stove will be all cabinets but that ends up being a pretty big kitchen you know if you think about it but like Melissa said it doesn't all have to be cabinets because I told her I said we got to watch out when you get that big of a kitchen you, that's where a lot of your expenses especially now since when I bought cabinets for the Louisiana house, they are almost exactly 100% more expensive. So one that costed $100 would now cost $200. So, and that's when we checked a few weeks ago when we were figuring them out for the trailer. So anyway, yeah, I think in the plan, the refrigerator goes over here somewhere. Then it was cabinets, kitchen sink with cabinets, stove with cabinets. I tried to talk her into putting a, a patio door, a sliding glass door right here so I could wrap this deck around, but she doesn't want to do that just because since it's a smaller living room, that really limits where you can put furniture because you're not going to put it against the door. And a patio door would be nice, but you know, I wonder if she would go, if she wanted the wraparound deck, I could do an, another full view door right there. I don't know. We're a couple of days away from figuring that out. Anyway, that's the layout for right now. Almost 7.30. I think that's a good day. We'll call it. Alright guys, we're back out here on the guest house. Yesterday was just spent uh, getting stuff ready in the workshop for when they come in two days to finish the boiler install. What I have to accomplish here is I need this wall up for at least eight feet and I've got a 12 foot wall. I went to the lumber yard this morning and picked this lumber up because my other lumber is not showing up until tomorrow for the walls, but I want to get this built because I want to have that furnace set and the water heater set in here and then I'll just cover it with a tarp or poly or something so I don't have to deal with hooking this one up. Uh, the water heater in the uh, back part of the workshop that I can do at a later date because for that one I'm going to want to have water all dug all in and complete and that's not going to happen until next spring. spring probably. I'll heat tape water to here for the winter but next year then I want them to dig it down eight feet and get it in correctly and stuff, but there just won't be time this year. Because the first thing I have to do is move that trailer before I can get underneath there to dig that in. Anyway, uh, what we have here is we have our um, bottom and top wall plate. Remember we measured in five and a half inches, which is the width of this. You know, I'm sure most of you all know a two by six dimensional lumber is inch and a half by five and a half. 
So we've measured in five and a half and we've snapped that line all the way through so it's perfectly straight. No matter what your rim joist does out there, ours is pretty straight, uh, you need the wall to be straight. So no matter what, if your wall ends up hanging over a little bit or it's in a little bit, you hope it's not in a little bit, but you need the wall to be straight. So I've, I've decided this one is flush. I could have done this wall flush and butted this one into it, but this is the wall I want to start with. So I'm flush out here with the rim joist. I'm at the five and a half mark here. I'm going to take an eight penny nail and I'm going to come in on this side and I'm going to just be up about a half inch to five eighths and I'm going to go at an angle and I'm going to drive that in. That's going to hold it steady. And also when we tip the wall, the bottom doesn't kick out on you. When we get like this wall, we're going to do it in three different sections. This is the only section I care about getting up right now because this is a utility room. Uh, if we had four guys here, I would build this all in one wall. That's a heavy wall and I wouldn't trust just the nails. So then what we do is cut a six inch piece of the banding that goes around the lumber, the metal banding. If you have metal, I haven't had any metal come out yet, but like when the trusses come out later this week, I would have, they're always metal banded. Anyway, I cut a uh, six inch piece of that, bend it in the middle, and then I would take that banding and put it here and here on this side, of course, over a stud or over a joist. And that's also where a stud will go because everything's going to stack because our layout will be the same. And then I would put a nail here and here and here and here on this side. Then when I tip it up, there's no way that wall can pick up. I've had several jobs where we've had walls that are 20 feet tall. Usually that's like the big wall that's in the living room or it's a big fireplace. Well, I've had 20 foot high walls that we've built a chimney chase on the whole 20 feet and then tipped it up. Something like that when you used a crane. If you have a 20 foot wall that's only 16 feet wide or something, you get, you know, five, six guys on it, you can lift it. But when you're lifting that, there comes a point when your guys are down here and there's more wall hanging over than there is below you and that wall wants to do this. So it's really important to have that down because that's a good way to get killed or injured. So anyway, we're gonna tack this down with eighths about every four feet on this one. Keeping it right on that line. And for this wall, that'll be good enough. It's gonna keep me in place, everything's gonna be fine. Also, you never want to do this right at the end because it's going to split out. Everything gets nailed back like this. Even when I, I don't know if you can see this six by six here, when I put my screw in to go into here, I did not put it on the end because that would crack it out. And then you lose all of your, uh, you know, your ability to hold everything there and it's gone. So you always screw it back farther. Same with this here. Stay back so that you don't split that out. Normally when I'm doing this, I would go ahead and these are 12 foot plates. I would do 12 footers. I would slap 12 footers against that and go and then add to the end. But the way this is laid out and the fact that I'm going to be lifting it in three separate pieces, there's no windows in that part. This is bathroom. There's going to be one little window here. This is bedroom. There's going to be a four foot window there. If I would have done if I would have went all the way through, there's a chance that my split wall would end up in a window. So anyway, I made sure that it didn't, so this will work. Also, if I am going to do this in one long wall, I'm not going to have, I, you know, I worry that too much information is going to comp, is going to uh, confuse people. But I would jog these over so you don't have them in the same place. Kind of creates a pivot point, not that big of a deal. But um, that's how I would have done it if this was just going to be one solid wall. So we're just going to do the same thing on this side. Flush everything up. There's my line. Tack that down. Another thing I need to bring up also as far as code goes, 
maybe I can explain it when I'm up here, but the way the sun is right now, <laughs> no matter where you put the camera, the camera is in the reflection. We're gonna be putting these studs every 16 inches. Once again, we're gonna start from here. We're gonna go 15 and a quarter, 31 and a quarter, 47 and a quarter, and it's gonna stack here. And that, so once again, if this was not a house, if there was a basement or a second story below this, they would be able to drill through here with a plumbing pipe, which wouldn't be in an exterior wall, but electric, whatever. And they're not gonna drill down and hit a joist. You know, their open area on top is the same as the open area below and go down. That's just good practice. Plus all the bearing stays straight down all the way. It would be this floor, if there was a second floor, it would be all the way down to the foundation. And in this case, this is our foundation, so we're fine. But you need to for code, one of two things has to happen. On your top plate, this top plate, there's another top, top, top plate, I guess, whatever you wanna call it, that goes on top of this, but that's not critical. This one here, where two of them come together, has to be where there's a joist, like in the center, so that that splice isn't doing this. There's a, a, you know, a two by six or two by four below it. So normally, if this was a long wall, I would lay it out, then I would come in here and cut this directly in the center and keep going. Another way to get around that, and what we're going to do here, because of the way we're building this wall, is you can have it, uh, like say in the center here, there can be a seam, and this is only for the top plate, not the bottom, doesn't matter. Then between the studs, when I'm finished, I'll take a flat block and put it up underneath there from stud to stud and nail that so it can't go down. Those are the two ways to get around that uh, code, and that's the way we're going to do it here. Normally I do like to stack it over, but it just doesn't work in this situation. Not very conveniently anyway. One thing that used to drive my dad crazy. You know how you make a measurement, you take your speed square, you come down, you mark it, done. When you get some people to come in there and then they'll do this. He would get so mad. I, I, he would just come unglued because it's like, you know, why are you marking it twice? I want to make sure I can see it. It's taking you twice as long to do it. <laughs> Boy, he would get so mad. That was one of his pet peeves for sure. When you're doing these plates like this and you're setting them up, uh, another thing to look at, like which one of these was it? This one here. See how it has that rounded corner? You never want to have this rounded corner on either like the outside here, especially the outside right there, because if it is, when you come time to set your trusses, you know, you, you're going to set them here. And you can't see that perfect where you've got a nice clean break right there. Also, if you're pulling across and you're trying to put your tape on there, it won't hook. And you're always, you know, you're only measuring from the outside usually, otherwise you're butting in and it wouldn't matter. So I always try to keep this down. You know, somewhere, it can be in the middle. This, you know, this would be fine. Now, in fact, let's do it that way. That doesn't bother me one bit. But if it's on this side, then you have a problem. So think about that. It's just one of those things where, I mean, is it gonna affect the building of it? No. But if you do things, think about things in the beginning, you're gonna save yourself a lot of time and headache later. So on each end of this wall, we're gonna have another exterior wall that's gonna come and butt against our, the actual wall when it's tipped up. So what you wanna do is, which I've already done here, is mark where your snap line is up and across like that and then the sign for a partition at least the way I was taught is a big X I know that's going to be a partition 
even on the center wall, when this one's going across, you don't, instead of going ahead and measuring in five and a half inches, you always go by this line because, remember how we said if the rim is crooked, it doesn't matter as long as the wall is straight? What if it was only five and a quarter down there and you measure five and a half? Because this is the mark that you are going to go by when you set this wall, when it goes against there, then something's off a quarter inch. It's, something's going to be out of level. So anyway, trust your line and make sure you do this mark because it really sucks later if you didn't mark that and then you have to try to, you know, then you're measuring and trying to figure it out or you have to put a level on it. This way you don't have to. So now I'm just going to lay this out. Once again, it's every 16 inches, but you start out at 15 and a quarter. So 15 and a quarter, 31 and a quarter, 47 and a quarter. And everything is stacking with the joist below. So now when we get down here, we're running out of tape. I still have more wall to go. Do not make this mistake. I've done it myself. I've seen so many people do it. When you hook onto this one now to mark, you're not doing 15 and a quarter. Now you're doing 16, 32, 48 because you've already set your three quarter down there. Can't tell you how many times I've seen that happen. You don't see it until the wall is all the way up and all of a sudden your sheathing don't work. Doesn't work, sorry. And uh, you're wondering what's going on. And once again here, up. there's our partition. Normally what you do is you want to come through here and mark out all of your walls and your windows, everything, before you start making your X's and stuff. This is going to be a two by four wall, so I have three and a half inches. Again, it's a partition. So we're going to do it like that. Uh, this window, I know where it goes. The bathroom window is still not un is still unsure, so we'll wait with laying that out. This is going to be a window that has a four foot by four foot rough opening, and it's going to be dead center of the room, so it's pretty easy for me to figure that out. So we got our center of our window, 48 inch rough opening, so 24, trimmer, stud. See why you don't mark it all first, because here is a, a mark where a stud is going to go. And if I already had a mark there, then it's going to be kind of confusing when you do these marks. And what you do is you do this at 24, then you turn around and you do this at 24, and then do your trimmer and stud, which we'll talk about. Then double check to make sure that you are 48 inches. And I am. Always double check. Now this is going to be our window opening, so the header is going to go here. So we're going to have our stud, which they call a king stud, and then this is going to be a trimmer. This is only four feet. If I were to go over four feet, I would do a, or if it was a micro lamb beam versus a two by ten header, I would then double this and this would be sliding back another inch and a half. There is code for that, but there's no reason for me to go through everything like that when we're just doing a 48 inch window. And for me, the way I was taught, I don't know why, trimmer was a C, X was the king stud or A stud. A lot of people will come in here and do a O. Uh, I had, when I had new guys that couldn't figure crap out, I would do S and a T. I would just get fed up and it's just like, so that I would do that. But anyway, X and a C is what we always did. So that's how I always do it. So now I'm just going to come back where my studs are and just put an X. And then when we get to the window, we still have something every 16 inches, but I just do this. And this one is close, um, within a quarter inch here. Each side of the window has to have a kicker or what they would call a cripple. Put a mark there. You gotta mark everything or people just don't know what they're gonna do. And I'll do one here also. Even though my 16 mark was way over here, I don't even know if you can see that. Even though my 16 mark is way over here, it should go that way. I still need a cripple 
on the end of my sill plate. So we're going to have this here. I bet you this is really confusing to some of you, but you'll see it when I actually build this part of the wall, which is not going to be today. And you'll see what I mean. When we come to these partitions like this on an exterior wall, whenever it's possible, we want to make an L corner versus having a stud on both sides. And the reason why this has to be done is for sheetrock backing. And sometimes you can't do an L corner because there's a window or a wall that's too close. But I'll show you here. And on this video, I realize that the wind is a factor for some of it. So if it seems like I left something out, because I'm going to end this video after today, uh, we'll come back to it because I've got to do this over and over again. But anyway, we're going to create an L corner like this. Where we're just going to be flush on the bottom and flush on this side. Now we take that and we slide it in here. The reason why is when this gets up, that other wall will hit into it, you know, on the back side and hit about here. So this is sheetrock backing. And the reason why we don't put a stud here and then just put another stud here is because then you have to insulate this before you put the other wall up. By doing it this way, they can come in and get insulation behind here and you don't have to, you know, play around with it at all. So now we're just going to go ahead and build the wall. Once again, remember how we crowned all the joists? Crown all your studs. I always crown them up. You can crown them up or down. Just make sure they're all the same. When you're doing this, and you're using an air nailer, you make sure you keep your hand back. I right, countless times, you get the new guys in there, holding that stud right there, come in with the air gun, shoots through the corner, shoots them in the finger. We're going to go ahead and put the top plate in. You've got this line right here for five and a half. Stay back away from that line about an eighth inch. I do, you know, better to have, or even at least a sixteenth. Nothing worse than when, you know, again, if it hangs over the line, then you got to cut this back or else your other wall is going to stick out farther. And here now, you nail where, over the stud too because no electrician wants to be drilling up or a plumber through this plate to get something up here and ruin a bit hitting a nail. 
So always nail over the same place. You have to get some on the end here also, but generally keep it above the studs. And now with this one, since this wall is gonna tie into that in one, I'm gonna let this run wild. We don't wanna have a seam here. This will tie it together. Otherwise we're really gonna get floppy. So now I just started with a small one, let this one hang over. When I tip up the next wall, I will make sure that its top plate is that much shorter so they just slide together. After you get your wall framed, then come down here and make sure you're still on your line because you've just been beating it around so it can get off a little bit. And then what we're going to do, I know some places build these walls and come in later and put the sheathing on. We always put it up first if we possibly can because then when you tip your wall up, it's you know, basically done. So you're going to want to square it to make sure that it's you know, perfectly square so when it goes up it's perfectly level. 173 and 16. One seventy three and three eighths, one seventy three and a strong eighth, Once your wall is squared up, you want to tack it down so it can't move. And then you can go ahead and put the sheathing on. Well, what I'm doing now is just setting the sheathing on here and I like to stay down about halfway on this first plate and that's because then it hangs down far enough so you know how we have our bottom plate then we have three-quarter plywood then we have our rim it's hanging down far enough to cover up the where the three-quarter plywood is it's covering up all those gaps and I don't know it just seems to make it tighter that way and I'm just stapling this with uh, these are inch and three-quarter staples and yeah, we'll get this set and get it stapled and it'll be almost done. Oh, the camera keeps shutting off because it's so hot out. <laughs> so anyway, I got the sheeting nailed, all of it stapled. And now I'm putting on house wrap. I don't have enough house wrap for the whole thing. I'll need to get another roll, but I want it on this part so that when they run that stuff through the wall, this is already there.
I was just thinking of some things that I didn't cover. The stud length on these walls is 92 and 5 eighths. Standard wall height in a house is 8 foot 1 and an eighth. Unless you're doing 9 foot walls, then it's 9 foot 1 and an eighth. So 92 and 5 eighths pre-cuts is what I bought. If we were going to do 9 foot ceilings, then we would have bought 104 and 5 eighths pre-cuts. And then, you know, 8 foot sheathing. And it all works out good. When we do this now, I will start this sheet right here and leave this open. This way, then I'll come out on the outside later and put a sheet that goes from this corner to right here. And that ties it in really good. When we would build houses that were like two stories tall with a walkout, so you're three stories, you know, you're over 30 feet in the air on the back side of the house. We got real good at running this past. We would then bring this all the way over to here, halfway on this stud, and then we would let this hang over. So then when we tip the wall up, somebody would be on top of the wall and could reach down and get, you know, get down about three feet, you know, two and a half feet. And then later on when we come around to do the house wrap, we would come up and then staple the rest of it. You don't want to have an air gap right there. You want this to be nice and tight and that holds it together. Another reason why I want a second wall up today, if any storms come, um, you know, if you have three braces on this, it's not going to go anywhere. Uh, but if you have another wall up, it's really not going to go anywhere. I have had it before where we had a house that had a wall. It was longer than this and we had that wall up and we had a brace like this and about every six feet down the whole line, it was braced and they had straight line winds that came and it's the only time in my life I can remember when we lost the wall. It took it right off the deck and then we had to clean all that crap up and rebuild the whole thing, you know.
it's much easier and faster to put one sheet, cut out half your door, and then drop another sheet and cut it out versus covering the whole thing up. And then you're trying to kind of guess where the door is. Here everything, you know, it's, it's just, it just takes way less time to do it just like this. And you could have done it where I cut just a, what does that look like, a 20 inch piece that went all the way up here and then pieced this in. Uh, but this keeps everything on layout and I wanted it on layout because this piece is sticking past the wall. Because then when I build the next wall, this is where layout is and it'll just, my other sheet will stop here and they'll just come right together. Now that the wind isn't blowing so much, we always put a, a bead of glue or caulking you can put under, but usually we always have glue, not always have caulking at this part, point in the job. And you want to get a nice bead under there because this keeps any wind. Even though you're going to have house wrap that's supposed to block it out, this just keeps everything from coming underneath. But one thing to remember, don't put it under your doorway. <laughs> Otherwise you'll end up scraping that out of there when you're trying to set the door. Well, this is gonna actually come out and help with this one. She just got home from work a little bit ago. And she's not going to want to be on camera, so I'll be back when this wall is up. Once you get your wall up, make sure you pull those nails that were tacking it down because later on, you know, against the wall is where you'll get the chunks of taping mud. And then you're coming along with your scraper and you're hitting those nails. Or the other thing is when you're going to be putting your trim on, 
if they stick out farther than the sheetrock, then you got to fight them there, and you can't get underneath them as good because there's sheetrock sticking there. So you always want to make sure that you get those out of there. Sounds like over here, before, remember I wanted the sliding glass door, and then we were just going to do the two four foot windows. But now I think we're going to put in like a three foot full view glass door, like our front door or the back door on the house. Same thing we're going to do here in the front. Because then at least if I do want to wrap that deck around, you could have a barbecue out there. And at least you'd be able to, you know, get outside from this side. And it'll let a lot of light in. When Melissa was out here to help me lift up that wall, uh, we were trying to figure out, she says, well, how big is the bathroom going to be and how big is the utility room going to be? And, you know, we haven't figured out the bathroom yet. I said, I think it's going to be between six, maybe seven feet wide. And then, I mean, this thing is four, eight, ten feet deep, you know, it's plenty deep. And, uh, and I said, because the bedroom ends right here. And she goes, what? That bedroom never was that far. <laughs> I says, you and I marked that yesterday. And the reason why I marked it like this is because I knew something like that would come up. She always has no filter, just talks. And then it's like, oh yeah, that's right. We did mark it there. <laughs> That's roughly where the furnace is going to go. I think it'll be a little bit farther that way. I think this is about where the bathroom wall will be. All I need to do is get my cold air to go up so I can carry. I mean, all I'm going to need is a double register somewhere there because that's one big room and I'm going to need one uh, cold air return in the bedroom. Okay, everyone. Well, thanks a lot for watching. I can tell already that this episode depending on how my editing can do, is going to be a mess because some of the clips are going to have to come out because of wind. And I have a tendency to think out loud. Like when I am trying to tell you guys about this window that we never really came back to, uh, I'm thinking about, okay, how is that going to be when I put siding on? Uh, what's that going to look like in the room? What's that going to look like with the dresser over here? i got to think so far ahead even with the furnace, the whole time I'm trying to tell you about that, I'm trying to figure out, okay, well, another thing that's going to kind of tell me where that's going to go is where the truss are set above it because I'm going to want to be able to come right out of here and go straight up through a truss opening and not have to jog around it. So I'll start talking and then I'll think about something and then think about something else so that in the end everything is easy. But I'll do my best to get this one edited and not be a total mess. Tomorrow now, I, I just got my text message came in that my lumber is going to be here for between 8 in the morning and 6 at night tomorrow. I've got another 100 or 130 studs coming, 40 more sheets of the wall plywood I think it is, or maybe 30 now because I picked some up. Uh, all the roof plywood's coming out. I don't know what else. I don't think I did 2x4 studs yet, but I got plate material, header material, and then two days later after that the roof trusses show up. But tomorrow anyway is, is finishing getting everything ready for the people coming in to do the boiler. I got stuff to get situated down in the basement, get the other furnace put into the back part of the workshop, stuff like that. The dumpster shows up tomorrow so I can get my wheelbarrow in here and start pulling this concrete out. Get that thrown into the dumpster. And once that's all in there, I'll start putting this in there until the dumpster is completely full. 
I will see you guys on the next video.